I think for educators who don't see gender and sexuality as explicitly connected to their job, this course will help you better understand the ways in which creating a welcoming climate for all young people improves learning and well-being in your classes. One thing that's interesting about schools is that they project messages onto young people that are often very implicit. We talk about that in this course as the hidden curriculum of schools. And even though your class may not specifically relate to gender or sexuality, there are lots of ways that messages about gender and sexuality can be transmitted through what's included in the curriculum, how you organize your classroom, the rules, or even the kinds of interactions that happen between students. For young people in classrooms, particularly marginalized young people like gender and sexual minority youth, feeling welcome and included is critical to true learning. By learning how to create a classroom that feels safer and more inclusive for gender and sexual minority youth, even though you may not consider yourself someone who teaches about the subjects of gender or sexuality, you can really improve the learning for all young people whether it's math or science or language arts. So a lot of the policies and practices that exist in schools today implicitly send messages about gender and sexuality. For example, when we have only two bathrooms, one labeled male and one labeled female, we implicitly send the message that there are only two gender identities and that young people need to fit into one of those two boxes. Other examples of the kinds of structures, policies, and practices that might exist in schools have to do with the way that we organize relationships. For example, often in elementary school, we organize students at tables or in lines based on our presumed assumptions about their gender identity. We can think about shifting that so that instead we ask students how they identify their gender and what pronouns they use, and we make sure that our structures reflect their own self-understandings of gender and the pronouns they want to use. Another example would be really learning to think about what's in our curriculum and what's missing. Also, many of the examples of LGBTQIA folks that do come up in history books are examples of people who've been oppressed, or discriminated against and are fighting back. So even when there are examples of LGBTQIA folks, they don't tend to be examples of joy or strength or contribution. A third example is thinking a little bit about how we support our educators and other staff in a school setting. Just like the students, educators need to feel like they can be their full selves and be fully included in a school setting. My hope for you is that if you take this course, and especially if you're able to take this course with colleagues, you leave with some critical ideas about how you can begin to identify and then change the structures that may be harming students in your schools. No school is gonna change overnight and no one course is going to fix all the issues that exist in a school. But my hope is that this course will help you think about LGBTQIA youth and other marginalized youth in concrete and specific ways that allow you to start to plan a longer term process of school change.